first thing I want to do is tone my panel to kill this white because as you can see all of that light reflecting back to our eye is going to be really challenging to judge any kind of colors or values. So I'm going to use a lot of my Marage here. Whoa! And um, just some burnt umber. If you want to throw in a little bit of blue uh, to cool that off or if you want to use a raw umber that would work or even like a, a raw sienna would be pretty. Um, so I, in choosing a tone, I just, and burnt umber is really the tra a very traditional uh, tone to choose. You want to pick a color that is some, somewhat neutral in color and also transparent. Uh, you know, so not too colorful and you don't want to, so you don't want to pick a big color, bold color to tone with and you don't want a transparent color. I'm sorry, a no paint color to tone with. Um, and I'm just using the Marage to thin it to make it lighter. And also that's going to be a nice um, surface to paint into once I get the painting going. Wow. Okay. My brushes don't want to stay up here. <laughs> All right. Um, so something like this might be good enough to begin and then I just always usually like to pick, take a paper towel and just knock it down. Um, lifting some of that um, wet medium on the panel because panels are more slippery. And let me pick up my brushes so we can get back, back to concentration here. Okay, so then as always, it's a good rule of thumb to um, lay out your approximate thirds of the canvas, dividing the canvas up into thirds, both on the horizontal plane and on the vertical plane. And of course, you can double check with your brush to see if you're about right. Doesn't have to be perfect, but this just helps you um, just helps you to be able to know the size of your canvas that you're working with. All right, so, and then I like to put first when I'm doing a shelf top, where's the shelf edge gonna be? And then I know that the pairs, let's say, are gonna be over here, right? Roughly over here, and I know the bottle is gonna be roughly on this first third here, and we have some uh, holly leaves coming in off to the left in the shadow next to the bottle. Now another thing you can do is do an envelope shape. It's a good idea not to make your objects too big. So on the tallest object or biggest object, this is where those thirds are helpful as well. So you want that tallest object to be somewhere in between a third and a half and no taller than the half of the height of the canvas generally. And so let's say if you have a vase with flowers or something like that, you also want to include the flowers and the vase, not just the vase. So that's a good way to sort of ensure that you are going to have enough room for your objects. And then I just like to use masses so that I can readjust things like, for example, wanting to pull this uh, bottle over a little bit more to the right to bring us a little bit closer to the pears. Just using the burnt umber, I'm just going to connect all these cast shadows up, all these darks that connect, and then I can find approximately the height of the pear. And while I'm here, put in a shadow shape for the pear. And that shadow shape is going to describe the form. It's going to curve with the belly of the pear. And then cast shadow is going to angle flat on the ground on the tabletop plane. And then this side of the pair, the right hand side of this last pair, has a shadow all along the edge of it. Now, don't get too caught up just yet in, in very specific drawing, all that kind of stuff. Just keep your shapes really, really simple and keep those darks connected right now. Um, we will bring in specificity later on as we work the painting. So I can kind of curve this a little bit down here for the shadow underneath the bottle.
Now if I have shadow in the background, which I do, I'm going to go ahead and just put in some umber back here. Uh, a little bit darker because that bottle really, even though it's a little bit darker, the bottle is very mysterious and just starts to kind of ooze out of the background, so to speak. So the values are very close here. And what's gonna make the bottle show up is going to be, let's say, the highlight on the bottle, the color of the ribbon, the color of the red. So try not to do too much work right now. Um, what I see happen a lot of times is that um, I see students that are putting in way too much information in this beginning stage. You want to try to reduce everything down as simple as you can possibly get it. Okay, and then I can use my paper towel to kind of wipe out for where the light's going to be on this pair. That's critical um, so that none of that umber is kind of dirtying up the color that's going to go underneath. Okay, so once you have your tone, you do your size and your placement, then we want to do background color. I'm sorry, size and placement shadows, then background color. So I've got all of those essentially in. And if I want to throw in, you know, some where the shadow is going to be underneath this shelf, that would be helpful as well. Now for this composition, you don't have to put in a shelf edge. There's nothing coming over the shelf edge. So you could just extend out the tabletop plane. You know, it's really just whatever suits you and your taste. Um, so while I'm here with my paper towel, I'm going to just kind of go ahead and wipe out where uh, some of the label of the bottle is and perhaps where the highlight is going to be. And maybe like where white is going to go on this bottle. Again, just so that doesn't um, affect the finish painting. Okay, so now background color. Once I do all those steps, step one, tone. Step two, uh, size and placement. Step three, shadows. Now I can go into background color. And I'm gonna use some black and some Naples yellow and I'm not going to worry about putting color over here just yet. And that's going to give me a really, you know, like cool gray. And I want a little more green and a warmer green tone to this. So I'm also mixing this in with the burnt umber because the burnt umber is going to bring a little bit of warmth to it. So this is kind of more what I want in this case. And if I want to go a little bit darker and even warmer, I'll add back in some more of the uh, black and burnt umber because that Naples really, really um, lightened it quite a bit. Now, it's super important that I get more of this color around the objects themselves. And since I'm out of burnt umber, I'm going to grab some Avignon orange instead to warm this up. So just because you ran out of one color doesn't mean that well, I guess sometimes you would have to absolutely reload that color, but essentially I just need something with a red base, like a rich, warm red base to this to kind of warm it up. And don't be afraid to paint over edges and, and lose drawing, okay? Uh, because that's going to prevent the look of outlines around your, your objects. That's another very, very important thing to keep in mind. Um, and then I'm going to mix a darker green version of this um, just right into the same pile, but just adding more dark, more uh, yellow, black, and some of the Avignon orange to get sort of a deeper green. And I really, I've got all that paint down in the ferrule of my brush with medium uh, because in oil paint, you work from dark to light, thin to thick and warm to cool, or you could say warm to opaque. Um, and that's pretty much the same as thin to thick essentially, but. All right, so once I have that done, and don't worry about any of this stuff in the background, you can always use a soft hair brush to uh, soften out any of the brush strokes. So once I've got enough of that color down, you know, something I just always do is take whatever that background color is and lighten it and use something very basically adjusting this color 
to be my tabletop plain color. That keeps the colors very harmonious. And really, I think of the tabletop wood color uh, just like I do background. It's all just a foil for the foreground material. Okay, once you do enough background, now we get to get to the fun stuff, get to the goodies, right? Which is the light and the color. And since I have burnt umber in for the shadows, I'm not going to worry about starting with shadow color mixture because that is um, a little difficult to do. Um, so, but what I will do is clean some of this off so that none of the, this affects the dark mixture that I'm about to have to mix for my beautiful uh, Grand Marnier bottle. Now, a fun challenge, again, is to simplify, always simplify and reduce the information, the, just all this information that you're seeing into the simplest statement that you can get. So I'm going to take some black, some Avignon orange, some alizarin crimson, and I'm going to get some really thick, juicy paint on here all over this thing. Now is the time where if I think, oh, you know, let's, let's, adjust the drawing a little bit or grow the bottle a little bit. Now's the time that I can do that. But even, even at this stage, I don't want to get too, too specific yet on perfect little contours and drawing lines. Kind of want to figure out, I'm just going to use the same color right now for the green holly leaves that are over here. And I can add since they're all in shadow, I can add and I can add some more green to it later on. I think people get way too hung up and obsess over, oh my gosh, I can't put that color there because that's not the color. It's more important just to see how things connect, in my opinion. And if the values connect, then, you know, and you know that it's like a shadow, then by all means, uh, if it's simpler, just use that. So I'm going to use some Marigé to kind of pull some of this paint I just put down off and get an idea of the drawing. Now, automatically, um, now I wish I would have saved my background color. Actually, let's just steal some of it with some white. It's better to steal it from up top. And just painting wet into wet, right? We're going to mix some of that color into the bottle color to get some of the dusting on the bottle. And this is really that fun game of, you know, less is more. Uh, what do I already have um, to reproduce the effect that's here? And, and it goes beyond uh, color matching, right? Um, or, or exact color mixing, because really the effect is just we need a little bit lighter, cooler color to, um, to illustrate that this is like a cool dusting on top. Okay, and then of course a highlight automatically is going to get me into the realm of a glass bottle. And then what I do is I think through, okay, what, what's the next most identifying characteristic, you know, even, you know, you, you could say the uh, label here, but I think beyond that, because even just the wipeout reads as a label. So essentially the thought process is going from simple, very, very simple in general, and let's say the highest priorities to uh, more specific. So I would say the next thing is definitely this ribbon. And so I'm going to turn my brush to the side to get a thinner, uh, thinner mixture. And this is Cad Red with Alizarin Crimson since it's not, you know, straight up Cad Red. And then, you know, where this, where this little label is here. Now this is an area where I do see people get really hung up and they, they start to really do this perfect, perfect drawing. Um, when we see words or a label, you know, we start to do this really perfect drawing. And you want to keep in mind that you want to paint the painting the same way all the way through. 
Okay, so if you if you all of a sudden start getting super, super tight on this bottle, it's going to be a problem um, if you're being looser in other areas of the painting and then all of a sudden you're getting in there with like a little tiny, tiny brush and doing all this perfect, uh, perfect uh, lettering and things like that. It's the, the language of the painting is going to break down and get a little confusing to the viewer. So try to resist. The mind has um, a tendency to, you know, kind of latch on to uh, certain things as like, it, and usually what it is is that we're afraid we're going to do it wrong. Okay, but anyway, so making one brushstroke at a time and trying to make simple shapes, really simple shapes with a flat brush, um, flat to the, the panel or the canvas so that you're not digging into the paint and you're just laying the paint on. We've got some subordinate highlights here that aren't as dramatic as say the one down there on the, the big part of the bottle. So sometimes with those wet into wet, I'll just use the back of my brush um, and then I can start to, now I can start to look more at the contours. So I like to work the center of the object really first and then start to look at the contours. But again, I want to, I want to just make brush strokes, even if it feels like it's uncontrollable or the brush stroke doesn't quite go where I want it to. I just, I want to be making brush strokes and not tighten up on the brush. And then I need a, I need some black and white in here for kind of the cooler, all the top planes will be cooler. And I do see a little bit of a top plane on that bottle. Okay. There's kind of a brown, brown color in here. I don't, it could even just be background color. It doesn't really matter if it's brown or not. Nobody's going to see this exact bottle. But now I could say put in some of the um, label with some Naples yellow and white. And this is a starting edge, so I want to really make sure that this starting edge is nice and clean and it's in the light. But then the label also goes into shadow, right? And then again, not getting, painting with the same kind of technique and approach throughout the whole painting. And I'm going to go ahead and put in sort of some uh, reflected light with some black and cad yellow, it's reflected light that's showing up in this bottle from the uh, little pear. And with reflected light, you want to keep it kind of soft in the beginning before you make it crisp because every reflected light is almost always seen in the shadow and um, shadow is always quieter. Okay. So, and then I work straight to the finish, right? So getting a, enough information here without going too crazy on the detail, right? And even if that's too much detail for you, it would be just putting like a little bit of red or a highlight, enough of the finish. And then I have to get over to the pairs to see, you know, how is that color going to relate to this color and, you know, the intensity of this, uh, yellow. So I'm right now I'm mostly using um, cadmium lemon and Naples yellow. I don't have any white in there yet because the highlight is going to be the most cool white that is on there. Okay. And then I'm going to start to just kind of slide in some cad red light here for this left hand side. And now I can think a little bit more clearly about the drawing, right? Or the drawing of that contour. There's no need for me. It's actually a hindrance for me to do very precise drawing uh, in the beginning of the painting because then I'm thinking drawing and I can't get out of drawing mindset. It's very hard. You know, if you start the painting and drawing mindset, it's very difficult to transition 
into painting mindset. You, you almost have to totally destroy your drawing in order to do it because drawing uh, is all about line, right? And it's a different kind of communication, whereas um, painting is all about shapes, okay? Uh, <clears throat> shapes and, um, well, you know, flat shapes and value, you know, flat shapes of value. It's about masses, so. Okay, so just starting with enough opacity here, enough paint, even if it feels like it's too much, you can almost never paint the lights too light, too thick, and the color, you know, too rich or too colorful at this stage. As you work the, the paint and the painting, paint naturally, the more we work into it, then it naturally just wants to dull more. So I'm gonna take some black and some cad yellow uh, yellow medium to get a warmer color here as the form is turning away from the light. And then I just want to kind of soften that, soften all of this. So as the form is starting to turn into the shadow. Now for highlight, I'm gonna do a little bit of this phthalo green cool with some white to get a really cool highlight. And I'm gonna to look to see where that is. Sometimes these appear to be like a one connected highlight and it's probably better if I disconnect them a little bit. I, these, these kinds of pairs um, don't have as much sort of separation between the base of the pair and the neck of the pair, but it's still a good idea to, you know, maybe kind of disconnect the highlight a little bit. And then one of these highlights should be the boss highlight. And that is the part of the form that is getting, that's bigger. Um, and so because it's bigger, it's gonna be reflecting more light. Now, if you have more time, of course, with your painting versus mine, um, you can let this paint set up a little bit more and then, of course, go back in and add more to it. Something else I like to do right away is just get kind of a reflection of the yellow in this pair. And I know it's going to show up over here too. So get a little bit of a reflection of that into the um, tabletop plane. And I might just walk some of that up into the under plane of the shadow of the pair. Now, this pair on the right picks that red up again. Fun, fun. So I'm just gonna start with some straight cad red. Now, it's important here that I pay attention to my brush strokes. And if the form is curved, I'm gonna curve the strokes, you know, and especially if the form is laying on its side like this and going back in space away from me, um, it's kind of a good idea for me to curve my strokes to get the perspective of the form doing that. And of course, we've got this highlight. It's really going to bounce off of there because it's against the red this time, which is darker in value. <coughs> and then, of course, we switch into the yellow. And mixing wet into wet, you know, I can just actually mix on the canvas itself again instead of agonizing over what is that exact color mixture and how would I mix that on my palette. It's just a heck of a lot easier and I, I believe actually more effective to let the paint do the work for you as much as possible on the actual surface. Okay, so again, just using those CADs with the white or the Naples yellow um, to bring in some more light.
form, always thinking about the form. Is the form turning under? Over which part of the form is getting more of the cool light source and which part is not? So in this case, with the light being on the uh, left-hand side, everything on this left-hand side is getting, you know, a little more of a cooler, cooler light. So that's where that cooler cadmium lemon comes in and some white in the mixture and say a warmer yellow uh, comes in on the back, back side of the uh, pear and also on the right hand side of the pear or underneath. Now, when your brush is digging in, it's also going to kind of mix the colors together. And it's instead of laying down a flat color, it's going to lift up some color, which you may or may not want. Now, you want that when you're wanting to dull something or uh, transition, you know, kind of use a transition area away from the light source but you don't want that on the most lit up edges. Actually, I'm just gonna paint all this together for right now because we have the stem coming out from there. And then I'm gonna add a little cab red light into this dark bottle color mixture I had before to bring back my shadow here, the darker red on the side. And then sometimes you might even use like a little touch of background color that either shows up in the in the shadow side of the object or on, you know, the back or the close to the shadow because that part of the object is turning around in space turning away from you and away from the light source in space. And I just want to redo this because it doesn't look how I want it to look. So let's get some fresh paint down. And sometimes you have to do that and it's, it's okay, you know. If something is not quite, you know, getting, getting the look that you want, it's okay to just paint right over it, you know. I rarely, I do, I rarely scrape anything unless it's just way too much to overcome, but it rarely, rarely is. So it's not a big deal to have to like redo a highlight or replace a highlight. Okay. Now, and then I think some touches of that deeper red on this side. And I like how this red kind of pulses us through the entire painting. Um, one thing I do want to look for here is how uh, just getting a little more specific on where the light meets the shadow on these objects. And then of course you can also get a little more specific on the actual shadow color. And like if I want this side of this contour to stand out a little bit more, I can bring in a lighter color in the background around it to carve it out and to pop it a little bit more. So finishing the painting, um, really becomes a matter of finding out, you know, uh, where do you need the viewer, where do you need more attention or more the viewer to look in a specific area? And then you ask yourself, does it need an edge change or does it need um, a value change, value contrast in order to make it stand out? Or maybe it needs a color change. He's got a little squash too close together, but that's okay. All right, and then uh, reflected lights. We want to look for any and all reflected lights that are showing up. So some cadmium yellow medium here in the shadow to really fill this shadow with reflected light, give it a lot of glow. 
um, so that the whole thing feels more luminous, uh, filled with light, putting off light into the background.